I fear this morning that I'm going to offend a great number of people, both outside of the faith and inside of the faith. We're going to be tackling a topic that is difficult, and so be prepared for a bumpy ride. But I would only ask that if anything I say, to measure it against the Scripture, against logic and reason. In 1954, William Golding published a book called Lord of the Flies. Now, this isn't to be confused with Lord of the Rings. That's a whole different thing. Lord of the Flies tells the story of some British people who are on an airplane in the South Pacific. The plane goes down and it crashes on a deserted island. And the only survivors are a cluster of boys. And so they emerge from this airplane... They find themselves alone on an island with no adults. What are, they going to, what are they going to do? Well, these young boys are from a democratic society, and so they decide the first thing we should do is vote in a leader. And so they vote in Ralph, who is athletic and handsome and charismatic, and, and Ralph becomes the elected leader of the island. And Ralph establishes immediately three rules On this island, there's going to be three rules. The first rule is that we are going to have fun. And so they paint themselves all up, and they run around all crazy, and they poke and pinch each other and act like crazy boys. The second rule is that they've got to find ways to survive. And so we've got to figure out where to get food and shelter and water and so on and so forth. And the final rule is that we have to start a fire and we have to keep the fire going so that if a passing by ship or something you know, comes by, they'll see the fire and they will rescue us. And so that was the rule established on the island. But many months later, when the boy's hair is long, A golding doesn't tell us how long has passed, but but the boys now have long hair, so we're guessing six months to a year. Many months later, a British naval officer finds the island, comes ashore, and he finds that the island is a smoldering wasteland, and that the boys have killed each other, and three of the children are dead. And according to the story, I should have thought, the officer says, that a pack of British boys would have been able to put up a better show than that. And upon confronting Ralph, the leader who is still alive, he bursts into tears. According to Golding, Ralph wept for the end of innocence. And here's the point of the whole story. And he wept for the darkness of man's heart. You see, this book was written just seven years after the world found out about the evils of Dachau and Auschwitz and all the things that went on during World War II. What the author is saying is that there is a natural and intrinsic darkness in the human heart. Now, some have accused accused him of being angry and bitter. But the question is, Are humans intrinsically good or bad? If you were to take 10 eight-year-olds, eight to 10-year-olds, and put them on an island by themselves for nine months, what would be the outcome? Well, according to Golding, they would turn to wickedness and violence. But if we look to the scripture, what we discover is that human beings, although they all have intrinsic value because of the Imago Dei, because we were created in the image of God, every single human being from the unborn to the uh, invalid to the person who's convalescing has intrinsic built-in value. And yet simultaneously, we are all prone toward wickedness. The scripture teaches that this story, the Lord of the Flies, is a true representation of human nature. That left to ourselves, we will kill each other, we will murder each other, and the only thing that will change us is something has to change from the inside out. We need a savior, and these boys did not have one. So we're going to talk today about children. Paul addresses this issue in Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to ask you to open up your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. What Paul has been doing... He has been describing how when we, under the power of the Holy Spirit, proceeding from truth and daily renewing our minds, 
that we can live holy lives. And then he goes on to address various demographic groups. And last week, he addressed those people that are married. He says husbands and wives. And just as a precursor, you can't really address children if you haven't addressed marriage. Because if the marriage is collapsing, then it's going to be difficult to raise children. And so what he's saying first is the marriage has got to be strong. And when the marriage is strong, then we can deal with the children. So the marriage came first, and now he's going to talk, be talking about children. We're in Ephesians chapter 6. We just have four short verses. This is what Paul says from the ESV. Children, obey your parents and the Lord. For this is right. Honor your father and mother, and this is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, the big idea for this entire section is that Paul wants to see within our churches healthy and godly families. And that starts from the marriage all the way to the way we deal with our children. And in this time, if you had employees or slaves, they would be part of your household and we have to deal with them properly as well. And we'll get to that next week. He's saying that the Christian household, whoever's in the household from husbands, wives, servants, employees, children, that we've got to conduct ourselves in a way that is healthy and godly because the family is the building block of society, and when that block crumbles, then the whole building comes down. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at children first. Paul addresses children, but I want to share with you two things before we get to what Paul is saying, and I want to share with you the Lord's plan for children. See, this is something that is not studied very often. I've never heard it preached on. It's not a concept that is put in the very front of our faith. But God has a specific plan for children, and we find it in the book of Genesis. You don't have to turn there. I'm just going to share with you the story. You see, we as evangelicals, we have a healthy preoccupation with the Great Commission, as we should, that we are to go and make disciples of all nations. This is called the Great Commission, because this is uh, something that should be in the front of our faith. And so we have this idea that Jesus came, he brought good news, and we're to go and share the good news with the rest of the world. This concept existed in the Old Testament. In Genesis 11, it tells us that Abram's father, Terah, was a resident of Ur of the Chaldees. This is modern-day Iraq, and he, he intended to move his family into the land of Canaan, but for some reason, they stopped at Haran, and they, they resided there. Now, Terah died when he's 205 years old, at which time the Lord to, appeared to his son, Abram. And in Genesis 12, the Lord was slowly pulling back the veil of his plan, and he told Abraham this in Genesis 12, 3. He says, all of the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. So understand, from the very beginning, the Lord's heart is that the blessing of God, the goodness of God, would go to everybody. It was not just for Israel. Israel would be the vehicle, but the blessing of God, the knowledge of God, the name of God would be for the entire earth. That was his plan from the very beginning. And so here's the first principle of this story, is that the Lord wants to bless the entire world. How exactly would he do that? As we'll see, his plan was to use healthy, God-honoring families. Now, at this time, Abram's now been renamed to Abraham. He and his wife and his family, they're camped out at the oak trees of Mamre, and they're sitting there in their tents in the heat of the day. You know, when it got to be around three or four, it got got real hot, so you would go sleep in your tent, and then when the temperature went back down, you would come back out. So they're hanging out in their tent, and in Genesis 18, it tells us that some men appeared to them. And these men are the Lord and angels. And they come to to Abraham and they say, Abraham, you're going to bear a child in your old age. Your wife, Sarai, is going to bear a child. She laughs. They rebuke her. But Abraham sees the men off. So he's got the Lord and two angels and Abraham. And they're walking and they're overlooking the valley of Sodom. And this is what the Lord muses to himself. Uh, Verse 18 in Genesis. Abraham is to become a great and powerful nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. This is a repeat of Genesis 12. Once again, Abraham, you are going to be the funnel through which we bless the entire world. How is he going to do that? The answer is in the next verse. 
It says, For I have chosen him so that he will command his children and his house after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. And this is how the Lord will fulfill to Abraham what he promised. Now, did you catch that? This is how the Lord is going to bless the entire world, that through Abraham teaching his children to live out their faith, and their children have children, and their children have children, and all of them are going to live out their faith as they spread throughout the world. This is evangelism through multiplication. So from the very beginning, from the first book of the Bible, God wants to bless the world, and he's going to do it by sending out godly families who will produce godly children and expand throughout the earth. This is the Old Testament Great Commission. So please understand that children are not just children, that God has a plan for them, that the purpose of you having kids is not just to have kids, but it's to raise up godly sons and daughters and to send them out. One more thing before we get into our text. I want to talk about the status of the first century home. What we experience, we tend to think of as normal, right? The world we live in, the way we raise our kids, what we do, what we watch, what we think, we think this is normal. In the Greco-Roman world of the first century, things were much different. The first thing we need to know about the household and the Greco-Roman world is that the father was absolutely in charge. There were no courts. There were no, um, you know, well, you have partial custody and I have cut. No, the father was absolutely in control. I'm not arguing that this is the way it should be. I'm describing what is. Um, women, in, in, especially in the Greek world, were considered just one step above a slave. Um, you would live under the, the care of your father. And then when you got married, you would move to the care of your husband. You would not work outside the home. You would work in the home. You would raise the children, and the father was the master of the household. Now, according to Roman law, fathers had so much power over their children that they could sell their children. They could whip their children. They could even put their children to death. A father had absolute power over his children. And so there were no courts. There were no, dis- you know, no disputes over custody. You were dad, and dad has 100% control. We need to know this as we approach what Paul is saying. All right, I want to get into the text here. First thing that Paul says is he addresses the children. So imagine you're at the church of Corinth, and all the, 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 the families have gathered together. And as far as we know, they didn't have separate nurseries. They gathered together as a church. Kids were present in the room. And so they're reading this letter, and Paul addresses them and says, children. Another cultural problem here. We have designations that didn't exist in the first century. We have newborns. We have babies. We have toddlers. We have children's. We have uh, preteens and teens. We have this designation, but the word children here doesn't tell us what age range he's referring to. But based upon the text, I understand this to be referring to junior hires and high schoolers. How do I know this? Because as Paul addresses the children, he is using a certain level of logic and reason. He's assuming that these children have made a commitment to follow the Lord that they understand enough to know what it means to follow the Lord. And also in this time period, if you were 17, you were not a child. So as best as I can tell, he's addressing 12 to 16-year-olds. Now, of course, the 10-year-olds could hear it and benefit from it. And of course, if you were 17 and still lived at home, it would apply. But he's talking to what we would call junior hires and high schools. And so if you are in this room today and you're a junior hire or in high school, this is specifically designed for you, although other ages, of course, can learn from this. The first thing he says is he addresses these preteens and teens. He says the word obey. It's not a word we like to hear, but Paul had just previously said submit to each other. Wives, submit to your husbands. We find this all over the place. So he says, children, obey. Now, one question we have, of course, is, well, how far does this obedience go? Well, of course, that every person to God command overrules person to person command. So we're told to submit to the governing authorities. But if the governing authorities tell us to do something that is contrary to another of God's command, then we don't obey. So there is a hierarchy, and the highest commands are the commands that God has given us in relationship to himself. 
And so obviously this is not a recipe for abuse. This doesn't mean that children have to be abused and have to live with abuse and they can't call CPS or they have to do things that God tells them not to do. This is a general command for teenagers and preteens to obey your parents under normal circumstances. Now, I like this. You know how when you tell your kids to do something, what's the first question they ask? Why? See, Paul's smart. He's going to lay out a rational argument for why children should obey their parents. Why should they obey them? He gives us four reasons. The first reason, he says, is I want you to obey, obey them as in the Lord. He's assuming that these Christian teenagers are saved, they understand lordship, and he's trying to communicate the same thing, that when we obey someone above us, we obey them as in the Lord. And so if I'm an employee, I can serve my employer, even if the employer is a jerk, because I do it in the Lord. If I am married and, and I, my spouse is rude to me, I can serve my spouse in the Lord. And he understands, teenagers, you might have parents that maybe aren't even Christians. They're not godly people. They're not fair. They do things that are not right. They tell you to do one thing, and they do another. And yet, I want you to obey them. Why? Because in the Lord. Because you've made a commitment to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, and this is what you need to do. The second rationale he gives us is he tells us this is right. Now, we live in a world where there is no such thing as right or wrong. Ethics are just a matter of your opinion. But according to Paul, there is an absolute right and wrong in the universe. They're not arbitrary. Right and wrong comes from the character and the person of God. He created the heavens and the earth, and he gets to set the boundaries. And if he says this is right, it's right. And it doesn't matter whether you agree or disagree. It exists on its own. On its own. And if he says this is wrong, it's wrong. And it's wrong before you were born. It will be wrong after you die. Our opinions are irrelevant. He says this is right. It is morally right to obey your parents. The third rationale is then he appeals to the Ten Commandments. Now, many of these teenagers listening in this room would have been Jewish people who grew up learning the Ten Commandments. And the Fifth Commandment says this. This is the, um, the version from Deuteronomy. It says, Honor your father and mother as the Lord your God commanded you, that your days may be long, and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord God has given you. So he says you obey them because of the Lord. You obey them because it's right. You obey them because it's in the Ten Commandments. And then one more rationale that's found in the Ten Commandments, he says that if you obey your parents, it will go well with you. What does this mean? Well, there's a, an immediate thing. It says that your days may be long. How long would your children survive if they didn't listen to you? Hey, we had mushrooms at home last week. There's some mushrooms growing on that log. We'll just go eat those things. Some of those are called death caps for a reason. Oh, there's a rattlesnake. I think we can kill it with a shovel. But your parents say, don't, don't do that. Hey, there's a rushing river. I swim in a pool. Why don't we just jump in there and see? No. No, don't do that. So there's an immediate return on this investment that if, if children, you obey your parents, they know more than you do. I know you don't think they do, but they actually do. And if you will just listen to them, the immediate result is that you will live longer. Now, in this world, 40 to 50% of kids died before they were 10 years old. This is why you had 15 kids, because six of them weren't going to make it. So kids who obey their parents in the short term are going to live longer. But there's also something else. There is a long-term disintegration of our culture when kids don't obey their parents. The promise of the fifth commandment is that when you honor your mother and father, when you obey your mother and father, that it will go well with you where? In the land. So what you do with your children affects the entire land, the realm, the state, the country, the county, the city. This is not an isolated thing. How you raise your children affects the territory. And if we don't 
train them to obey us, then it's not going to go well with us in the territory. Now check this out. In Romans 1, Paul is describing the results of people rejecting God. And look what he says. Here's what happens. If you can't read it, just listen along. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind and to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. He lumps disobedience to parents with murder. Why is this so serious? We're going to find out. But he says the result of people not following God and rejecting the truth of God is that it's going to lead to children being disobedient to their parents. Now, we can follow along here, and we find that in 2 Timothy, Paul is referring to the end times, okay? He's talking about when the world is closing up and the end is near, this is what he says. But understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, and what? Disobedient to their parents. It is a sign of national judgment and national rebellion when kids no longer obey their parents. Now, how can kids just stop obeying their parents? Well, they can't. There's only one way this happens. Either parents won't apply consequences or the culture won't apply consequences. Because a kid on his own doesn't just have the ability to just, I'm going to do whatever I want. No, with parents there, that they're going to they're gonna force that out of the kid. But when parents or culture says, do what you want, there's no consequences, the result will be a cluster of children who disobey the Lord and it won't go well with all of us in our land. Now, this is why we have young men killing each other in larger cities like Chicago. Teenagers killing teenagers. And the constant rhetoric to explain this mass murder that is dumped out upon us is that it is the other political party's fault. We need more funding. We need more programs. It's caused by institutional racism. And there was even a report from the New York Times that tried to compare climate change to murder in Chicago among teenagers. But my friends, the scripture cries out It is not funding, it is not politics, it's not climate change, it's not racism. Racism. Kids are killing each other because there are no fathers in their homes. Nobody wants to to confront that truth. Their homes are broken, there's no parents, there's no fathers, the kids are feral, and they're doing what they did on the island of William Golding. They're killing each other. The fifth commandment is being played out before our very eyes. The kids don't have parents to obey. There is no accountability. There is no right or wrong. There is no structure. There is no consequence. And guess what? It is not going well in our land because of this. Let's move on to verse 4. Fathers. The first question I have is, why, why isn't Paul addressing mothers here? Well, it could be he's speaking directly to the times, and the mothers had no power in this environment, so he's speaking to the fathers. But I do think there's something different about fathers. Study after study after study shows that when a father is not in a household, something changes. I'm not saying mothers aren't important. I'm not saying that at all. But there's something about fatherlessness that devastates children. Here's the first thing he says to fathers. He says, I I want you guys, you fathers, not to provoke your children. And he says that this is going to end in bitterness. Now, why is this the first command? Because in this world, fathers had absolute uh, control. They could sell their children, beat their children, kill their children. And I know that some of you in here may feel a sense of bitterness because your father in particular was too hard on you. He was too harsh. His punishments were over the top, and not proportional to with what you did. Paul understands men, the Lord understands men, that we will tend to confront any sort of situation with anger and violence. So Paul says, 
Fathers, 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 you, you can't be that way. That's the way the Romans do it. They beat their kids, they sell their kids, they kill their kids, not with you guys. Do you need to punish them? Yes. Do you need to have discipline? Yes. Should there be boundaries? But you should do so in such a way that does not cause them to hate you later in life. The second thing he says to fathers is he says, I want you to bring them up. Verse 4. Well, you can't bring up children if you're not there. Absentee fathers are a huge thing. And I think even emotional absentee absenteeism is a thing where we're more concerned with watching the game or turning a wrench or playing a video game or being out with the friends than actually spending the time with our children. If you're not present and if you're not emotionally present, then you're not bringing them up. So how exactly should we bring them up? Well, he answers that in verse 4. He says, I want you fathers to bring up your children, not in a way that causes them to be bitter and to overdo it, but I want you to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Men, your responsibility is to bring your children up in the instruction of the Lord. And one of the problems we have is we have institutional surrender. Institutional surrender is the belief that I know this needs to get done, but there's an organization that's supposed to do it for me. If you want your kid to learn the Bible, well, what do you do? You send them to church. It's the pastor's responsibility. It's the Sunday school teacher's responsibility. It's the youth pastor's responsibility. We send them away. We we, um, hand out our authority and our job to someone else. And Paul says, no, you fathers, you bring them up. Now, there's nothing wrong with sending your kid to church and Sunday school and and youth group, but what he's saying is that you have to take the responsibility upon yourself. Now, I do want to mention something here. When it comes to the education and the raising up of our children, we, of course, have to be heavily involved. And as you know, my family is homeschooled, and I'm not one of these uh, pastors or people that thinks that if you send your kid to a public school that you're doing wrong and that you have, to, you have to homeschool them to protect them. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is that if you send your kids to public school, there are certain challenges that you're going to want to consider. For example, if your kid's riding your bike around the parking lot, you don't put a helmet on them because they're just chilling out. But if your kid is riding down a dirt road at high speeds with lots of rocks, there's greater danger. And so you put the elbow pads and the helmets on. Vody Bauckham once made this analogy. He said that if he said that most Christian parents wouldn't send their kids to a Muslim school. Well, why not? Well, they're not going to be affected by auto shop class, but if they learn history, they're going to learn it from a Muslim, pers- Muslim perspective. If they learn uh, health or uh, sociology or science, it's all going to be from a Muslim perspective, and parents probably wouldn't do that. But parents will send their kids to a public school, which has teachings that are completely contrary to what we believe. In history class, they might learn that America began in 1619, and that the founding fathers were patriarchal slave owners. If you... To put them in science class, they may learn that billions of years ago, something came from nothing, produced life, which evolved to create mature monkeys that could read and write. If you send them to social studies, they may learn that gender is manufactured by culture. There's really no such thing as gender despite the the different chromosomes. If you take them to health class, they may learn that sexual activity is normal and healthy and go ahead and experiment. And uh, if a girl wants to get an abortion or if anyone wants um, uh, any kind of sexual education, they can go to Planned Parenthood next door, which does not require your consent or your knowledge. When I was a pastor in Merced, uh, Merced High School had a fence, and I'm not kidding you, 10 feet from the fence was a Planned Parenthood. And any 14-year-old without their parents' knowledge or consent could walk over there, get an abortion, get birth control, get whatever they wanted. I'm not saying that that, uh, public schools are bad. Of course not. There are awesome, great people there. I'm saying that in the schools, they're going to be taught things that is contrary to what you believe and I believe, and we have to be proactive. It means we have to have discussions. We have to find out what they're learning. We have to get involved. We have to advocate for non-political teaching environments. We have to get them in a strong Bible study. We have to model, uh, how, we have to model um, how they should act and what they should believe and, and how they should live their lives. And so there is some extra precaution that has to be taken in those environments. What I'm saying is at the end of the day, You are responsible for the raising up of your children so that it will go well with us in the land. About 
15, 13 years ago, I was lifeguarding at a pool outside of Oakland. It wasn't in Oakland, but it was one of the areas outside of Oakland. And as a lifeguard, you're trying to keep people safe. You can't run on the deck because you could fall and break an elbow. You know, you can't do certain things in the pool. And so we sit in a chair and we watch and we call out certain people. Hey, I need you to back off. Stop doing that. Uh, stay off your shoulders, please. Put that knife down. That sort of stuff, right? <laughs> so um, I'm out there calling commands. And there, there were a group of kids that whenever we called them out, they would get mad. And they would start cussing and giving us the, the IQ number and everything else. So pretty normal. A lot of, a lot of uh, parentless children hanging out. So the, the day ends, and we're closing up. We get everything closed down. We're locking up the property, and I'm walking out with another gal. We're both employees, and this kid starts walking toward me. When I say kid, he's probably 15 years old, but he's a big kid. He's probably 5'8", weighing 160 pounds, and he's walking toward me. I recognize him as one of the kids that was mad and giving me the middle finger. So he walks right up to me, and he says, bleepity bleep you, and bleepity bleep you to the girl with me. Now, my first response is maybe what your first response would be. Nietzsche says that the first reaction is usually the correct one. He's wrong. Okay? So I'm like, calm down. But I realize this is a big 15-year-old, and I don't know if he's going to, like, take a swing at me or the girl. So I kind of move to block him, and the girl's backing off. And then he just starts chewing us out, and I restrained myself. And then after a while, he, he walked away. It made me realize that this, this kid is out there all day by himself, no parents, and he's been taught. There's no consequences. There's no boundaries. Authority is stupid. I can curse you. I can cuss you out. I can do whatever I want, and there are no consequences. And the more kids we have like that, according to Deuteronomy chapter 5 and Exodus 20, it is not going to go well in the land. So the problem is solved here and now with you, fathers and mothers. It starts with you having a healthy marriage, healthy enough to function as parents, and then actually go and raise your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And you might be a grandparent or an uncle, and you can help with that. You might be a single person, and this is something that you can look forward to, that this is one of the responsibilities, that you don't get married until you're ready to raise up a child in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. At the end of the day, we can make it go well with our land if we will teach our children to obey their parents. Let's stand together and pray.